So good afternoon. Um, I'm calling from Santa Cruz, California, um, where I'm based, um, along with Brad Kitt, who, as Jennifer mentioned, is our Oceans and Islands um, Director. So I'm happy to be talking to you today about um, some of my favorite birds um, and kind of bridge this gap between um, the conservation and the science with the policy actions. And I think um, the Albatross and Petrol Conservation Act is a um, is, is a pretty critical act uh, for the many of the species I study um, and the 146 global species of concern. Um, so I want to just uh, take a minute to um, tell you where my history with these birds um, starts, and my screen will allow here. Um, so there's a picture in the right-hand corner of me in about 1994 on Laysan Island when I first um, met these birds like this black-footed albatross pictured and the Laysan albatross pictured. And little did I know that 25 years later, I'd still be uh, talking about these birds. And also what's astounding to me is that many of the birds that I met on the island um, that summer um, are still living today. So these are really long-lived birds um, and our, our lives are sort of parallel in that way. Um, I've also, just as a note, I put my email down in the left-hand corner. Um, so feel free to reach out to me if you have additional questions or follow-ups on this webinar. Um, so interestingly, um, you know, my my journey with the albatross began in the mid-90s, as did the American Bird Conservancies. And um, ABC, as it's known, works to protect seabirds through direct conservation, outreach, and policy. Um, and it was really in the mid-90s that the effort in industrial longline fisheries was ramping up in the middle of the Pacific um, and brought a call to action um, for ABC and other uh, bird conservation organization to really address this issue. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the most direct threats, um, but first I want to um, just introduce you to some of the species in their natural history and ecology, um, and then get into the threats and conservation need, and then more of the specifics of what this Albatross and Petrol Conservation Act um, or H.R. 1305, as it's known in the U.S., will do. Um, so at that point, I just want to stop and make sure everybody can hear me okay. Um, any audio issues? Jennifer, everything going all right? You sound great, Hannah. Okay, okay, good. Thanks. So um, the albatross, shearwaters, petrels, and the small storm petrels are all part of the order Procellariformes, um, or the tube noses. And so um, they have this characteristic uh, feature on the top of their bill, um, which is the external opening for their nose, and that gives them this really keen sense of smell and also helps them in navigation. Um, and so that's a feature that distinguishes them from um, the closely, um, you know, resembling gulls, the larids, um, and skuas, but these guys have a very different uh, morphology. Um, so here's, the, in this next slide, a picture of some of the diversity of the Procellariform seabirds. So, so there's four families, um, the albatross, the petrels and shearwaters, and then there's two families of storm petrels. Um, and for the most part, the act covers the majority of these species, um, and storm petrels have yet to be added to this list. So these are primarily surface feeding birds. And you can see in the upper right, the northern fulmar has this really exaggerated tube. It almost looks like a drinking straw on the top of its bill. Um, and these guys have a really great sense of smell for locating prey across the vast ocean. Um, and also it's thought that they use that sense of smell to hone in on their colony so they can smell um, colonies from great distances. You'll also notice in the bone and petrel in the center, they have these real um, long tapering win, wings, and that enables them to traverse uh, large areas of the ocean with very little energy. So here's the Laysan albatross. 
Um, they're very far ranging. Um, the Laysan albatross has a range of about 49 million square kilometers. So try to wrap your head around that number. Um, they're traversing huge areas of the Pacific. And again, the way that they do this is they have real efficient design. So um, it's quite spectacular to watch them um, in midair, um, in high wind speeds, as you see in this picture, where their wind, wings are just straight across, and this is about a seven-foot wingspan, um, and there's not much flapping flight at all as they use the wind's energy um, to make a sort of a figure eight sort of paddle, um, pattern as they move up into the wind current. Um, so this enables them to move great distances with very little um, energetic costs. And as a result, we see that this is the range of the Laysan albatross here. So just to orient you, the continents are in um, kind of this grayish green color. Um, and you can see this dotted blue line um, that starts around French frigate shoals and goes, extends to British Columbia and over to Japan. That is the range of the breeding, breeding birds uh, tracked by satellite um, uh, from Turn Island in the Central Pacific in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So it is there that they have their eggs and their, their chick every year. Um, and then they move up into these productive waters um, of the Northern chlorophyll frontal zone um, where we know there's abundant fish and squid um, and also lots of fishing activities. So huge range. Um, and then they're constrained. They have to come back to these colony areas. So here's a picture of Midway Island, um, mid-season with lots of activity. Um, and what's quite spectacular to me is that they can traverse these huge ocean basins and then come back to the very same uh, patch of grass on a very particular island. And they will come and wait for their mate. Um, so they're considered um, monogamous. They're very uh, sight loving or philopatric and also uh, very tied to their specific mate. Um, so they're, we call these nesting aggregations colonies. Um, and each nest only produces one egg per year. And if they're lucky, that chick will survive to fledging or leaving the nest. Um, but it requires the effort of both parents. Um, and albatross are adapted to um, make a living in the wide ocean or the pelagic ocean, um, but it also means that they sometimes have delayed maturity. So in many species, it's 7 to 12 years. In Laysan albatross, um, it can be as late as 8 to 10 years um, till they initiate the first nest. Um, and they're also very long-lived. So wisdom, the albatross, the, it's the, um, I guess, the holds the longevity record for any living wild animal. It's 68 years old this year and had a chick. So pretty extreme life history traits. Um, another species I want to share with you, another one that's in my backyard, this is the sooty shearwater that um, nests in dense aggregations, but also feeds in big dense aggregations. And this is um, off the coast of Monterey Bay, and a picture taken from shore of a huge flock of city shearwaters that come into our bay to feed on um, the great wealth of anchovies um, that occur every fall. Um, and again, um, here's the migratory range of these species. You can see they make these enormous migrations between breeding colonies, which are in southern New Zealand, um, up into the North Pacific. Um, and, you know, this flight from California, I've done it many times, down to southern New Zealand is about 12 hours on a plane. Um, and for a city, sure water takes about 15 days. And they're not really feeding in between the foraging areas in the North Pacific and that transit back to their breeding colony, um, but they're feeding um, enormously when they reach the productive um, cold currents of the California current, the Gulf of Alaska, um, and the Kuroshio current. Um, the purple 
color shows them um, while they're breeding, they're feeding in the Antarctic convergence zone. So amazing uh, migratory movements that are very directed. And again, you'll get within a nest, one, you know, the male going to Japan for non-breeding and the female going to the California current and they return to the very same uh, nesting hole. These guys nest underground um, every year. So spectacular movements um, and really critical um, requirements as far as nesting. So they're concentrated in these nesting areas. Um, and one last example of a far ranging um, pelagic seabird. This is the Hawaiian petrel, which is an ESA listed species um, that breeds um, on Kauai Island and Mauna Loa on Big Island and Maui. Um, and this is data from USGS showing these giant um, movements that they make from their breeding uh, site all the way up into the convergence zone in the Gulf of Alaska. So fantastic movement. Um, they also play important roles in the island ecology in which they inhabit. So this is some really interesting new information that um, has been published recently demonstrating that there's a really strong linkage between seabird derived nutrients um, and the productivity of the near shore environment. So there's a lot going on here. Um, and I'll just quickly walk through. Um, so seabirds, this is a red-footed booby, but I just thought it was a good example of uh, deposit seabird guano in the form of nitrogen and, and phosphorus into the island system. And you can imagine, you know, a colony of 100,000 to 500,000 to a million birds are depositing, excreting great quantities of guano. Um, this gets leached through these porous soils, through rainwater and runoff, um, and into the nearshore environment. Um, and experimentally, people have shown that um, with the addition of seabird nutrients, so in the middle panel, you see improved coral growth um, compared with treatments where coral propagules are um, not fertilized with that um, addition of of nutrients. And so you can see there's a real uh, increase in coral growth as well as a resilience um, to uh, bleaching. And that was another study that was done. So really interesting. And I put the citations at the bottom um, and I can provide you with some of those references if you're interested in that. Um, and finally, it not only it, uh, impacts coral growth, but it increases near shore plankton abundance. Um, and this has been shown to increase the abundance of planktivorous fishes, such as manta rays. And that study was done on Palmyra Atoll. And most of our information comes from tropical islands, which are generally nutrient depleted or, or uh, lacking in those uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. But um, I'm sure that this pattern would hold true as we look at in other areas like temperate zones. So just some of the cool, cool facts about seabirds. Um, there are also indicators of what's happening in our ocean. Um, and many of you have probably seen these images of uh, plastics in um, albatross chick stomachs. Um, and it's certainly a pervasive, um, ongoing, and an increasing threat to these, these birds. Um, and it also indicates uh, pollution in our waterways. Um, so I guess I'll, the kind of first part of my story is that, you know, albatross and petrels in shore waters are iconic. You know, they're these amazing migratory and far ranging species that have this ability to connect to land and sea. And they are important drivers ecologically in near shore ocean health and also indicators of ocean health as we saw with plastics. Um, and they're also really culturally important. And there's, you know, the rhyme of the ancient mariner is a classic of, um, you know, connection of people to this, these wild animals that are out um, roaming the ocean. Um, but there's, you know, more recent uh, literature um, like the Eye of the Albatross by Carl Safina 
and cultural linkages with people throughout the Pacific that are really important to recognize as well. Um, so with that, I will turn to the threat. Um, and seabirds, unfortunately, because of their concentrated aggregation, have been um, subject to a legacy of exploitation. Um, and guano mining on tropical and temperate islands has occurred since the mid-1800s. Um, and that also kind of coincided with the extraction of other kinds of seabird parts, um, so feathers for the millinery trade, and also eggs um, for human consumption. And so here's a picture of Laysan Island, and these, these uh, trolleyways um, were designed for extraction of guano, but they were put to use as well to collect eggs um, during the breeding season. Um, today, the primary threats on islands are introduced mammals, many of which were brought with those early um, people that came to the islands, um, things like rabbits and cats and goats and sheep and pigs um, that all decimate these ground nesting seabirds, um, either by destroying the habitat, as in the case of um, grazing rabbits and um, goats, but also direct consumption by um, cats and, and pigs, so, um, and recently mammals like uh, mice have been shown to be predators on even the largest albatross. So very vulnerable on islands. And then at sea, the primary threat is that of fisheries bycatch. Um, and I'll describe that in greater detail, but um, bycatch in both long line and trawl gear and some other gear types, but those are the primary um, threats currently. So introduce predators. Um, so as I said, you know, these are ground nesting albatross and petrels are nesting underground um, where they're vulnerable to non-native introduced animals. And these are a couple of screenshots from Kauai Island where there's a continuing issue with free roaming and feral cats, um, even coming into National Wildlife Refuge property. Um, and they're Notoriously difficult to remove, um, but steps can be taken to protect these colonies. Um, that's introduced predators, and um, ABC has been working with um, folks to protect some of the nesting sites um, around petrels and albatross. Industrial fisheries bycatch. The bycatch is the incidental capture of birds by fisheries. And ABC started its engagement with fisheries bycatch, as I mentioned before, in the mid 1990s. Um, we helped to draft guidelines for FAO um, for reducing the incidental bycatch of birds in fisheries. And essentially, what we're seeing is that there's an interaction between birds that are. Um, attracted by these vessels that are putting out vast quantities of uh, fisheries discards into the sea. Um, and uh, they're also then getting um, injured by the gear that is deployed from the boat, so the, the baited lines and hooks. Um, sea level rise is an emerging threat. Um, so I put this in here in our, in our threat category. Um, and this is particularly an issue for the Hawaiian albatrosses, the Blackfoot and Laysan albatross. And I would direct you to Pacific Rim Conservation and Fish and Wildlife Coastal Program and the Refuge Program that's been doing some work to start to plan for um, those, that threat. Um, so as a result of these uh, primary threats, um, seabirds globally are in a state of depletion and there's some uh, key papers that have directed our attention to this, you know, as early as, um, you know, the 80s, but really Croxville's paper in 2012 was a, um, a seminal paper to say, look, here a third of the world seabirds are threatened or endangered, and there's a real need to um, affect uh, conservation action. Um, 15 of the 22 species of albatross are listed as threatened or endangered. 
um, and we could go down the laundry list of species, um, but the threats are pervasive and appear to be increasing as are these emerging threats such as climate induced sea level rise. Uh, Polanski's paper that came out a couple of years ago demonstrated that among the world's monitored populations of seabirds um, since the 1950s, and this was studies um, that were compiled of 20 years or more in length, um, we saw that there's been declines in 70% of those studies. Um, so truly this is a seabird crisis. Um, and if we look in comparison to other species of uh, threatened marine vertebrates, so shorebirds, mammals, fish, shark, and reptiles, we see that um, seabirds harbor more of a higher percentage of the critically endangered species. Um, and this is um, relative to the IUCN uh, categorization. So they are among the most threatened and we really are at a point where we need to take um, some really coordinated and strong action for these birds. Um, so here, the last part of the story is the Albatross and Petrol Conservation Act. And really, um, in a nutshell, you know, to uh, see these birds into the future is gonna require um, a lot of international coordination for the long-term preservation, maintenance, and, and enhancement of these populations that have been decimated from the threats, um, as I've described. Um, and I wanted to give you an example of how international coordination can be effective. And this was prior to the advent of the International Agreement on the Conservation of Albatrosses and Petrel, or ACAP as it's known, um, the short-tailed albatross was listed as an ESA or endangered uh, species in July 2000. And it was clear that fisheries bycatch threatened the species recovery. Um, and American Bird Conservancy and other NGOs got involved in um, trying to ring the alarm bells about what was happening with this species and other species in the North Pacific. Um, and there was a real coordinated action among um, Japanese researchers, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, U.S. NIMPS, um, and this was sort of um, under the auspices of ESA, um, but it demonstrated that recovery um, and solutions could be found um, when actions were taken together. So I think it's a really nice example of that. Um, this is the range and feeding area of the short-tailed albatross. So similar to what we saw with lace hand albatross, they really traverse um, the entire North Pacific Basin. Um, and these are um, satellite tracks um, demonstrating uh, their movement, but also uh, the areas of more use in red and yellow. Um, and you'll notice off the U.S. coast, you'll see also these little blobs and we've recognized that the coastal waters are really important, including um, through the Bering Sea, there's this shelf break area that's very important for this species. Um, and so um, in addition to satellite telemetry to understand where these birds were traveling to, what the range overlap was, there was work done on the colonies colony restoration, protection, and translocation um, to enhance those populations. And then there's quite a bit of work um, in fisheries on mitigation. Um, and so in the end, um, we're now at a state where the short-tailed albatross is increasing and expected to do so into the future. And it is that international collaboration among an interagency collaboration that's helped to promote this species. So um, I think this is a great case example of how um, what ACAP is doing will benefit these birds. Um, so then let's talk about some of the nitty gritty. Um, so this bill that's been um, introduced uh, H.R. 1305, the Albatross and Petrol Conservation Act by um, Senator Lowenthal from California, is really the purpose of this agreement is to implement 
this larger um, international treaty called the Agreement on the Conservation of Albatrosses and Petrels. Um, and that agreement is signed by 13 party states, um, including many uh, range states in South America and the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and uh, Mexico, Canada, the US, um, and at times Japan have all participated in meetings of ACAP as um, range state, um, non-party range state members. So we already have spent a lot of effort um, having people attend these meetings and participate um, as range state members. Um, but this act in the U.S. has passed would allow us to become more formal decision makers um, and to more fully implement um, some of the conservation measures that are outlined. Um, and I grabbed <clears throat> from the text of the bill the conservation measures that are outlined, uh, including the reestablishment of species, as we've seen with short-tailed albatrosses, was a really important part of the recovery efforts for that species, management of non-native species, habitat and conservation and restoration actions, um, management of disturbance and other human activities, as well as education and public awareness. Um, and another key part of this is that interaction and coordination among nations. And so if you reflect back on uh, that albatross range map, you know, those birds are traversing traversing the entire Pacific Basin, and so the cumulative impact of fisheries need to be um, determined as we start going forward um, with the conservation of these species. Um, how does ACAP affect change? And um, I've been fortunate enough to attend um, two of these ACAP meetings. They occur every about 18 months, the working group and the advisory committee um, meets every three years. Um, and really the nitty gritty of the work goes on in the working groups. Um, and the two main working groups are the population conservation status working group um, and also the seabird bycatch working group. Um, and so if the U.S. were to become a party, we'd have more of a voice and influence um, within these working groups and be able to um, bring our expertise and share our information on um, the status of our species, um, the trends that are happening, um, and help uh, craft fact sheets and best practices for monitoring and trend assessment. And that's a really important part of the work of the population working group. Um, the Cedar Bycatch Working Group um, is, it, is an interesting place where uh, a lot of technical expertise is shared um, and innovation, innovative solutions are um, crafted. Um, and I should say here that um, interacting with the fishing community has been a really strong component of the work of the bycatch working group. So many of the experts work directly with fishers to um, design solutions for reducing bycatch. Um, the process is peer reviewed, so there's white papers that are presented um, and everybody has a chance to review them and vet them. Um, and it culminates in best practice guidelines that are um, put in both technical terms and lay terms, um, specifically for the most damaging fisheries for these birds. So long line, trawl, and they're also drafting guidelines for per same fisheries. Um, and a, a key part of this is it's all voluntary um, in terms of the, um, the guidelines. These aren't mandatory guidelines. Um, these are demonstrated best practice with a high level of rigor. Um, and so um, the technical advisory group is putting the information out there for the nations and the party states to review and to use as they see necessary to protect the birds in their waters. Um, and so there's no enforcement um, that's um, enacted through this treaty. Uh, here's an example of a fact sheet 
Um, and so you can go, the website is acapfit.aq, and you can look up all the species that are listed. Currently, there's 31 species listed under Annex 1. Um, this includes all of the large albatross, all 22 species of albatross, um, two species of uh, petrels, and seven shearwaters. So um, quite a diversity of birds. Um, but you can look at the fact sheet and get a synopsis of the status, the conservation needs, the threats, and the current action. So it's providing very tangible, hands-on information um, that's freely available. So really important resource. Um, and then they also provide these mitigation fact sheets. So here um, is an introduction to the seabird bycatch mitigation measures, and there's a series of 14 fact sheets um, that demonstrate um, what types of mitigation are possible for different fishery types um, and how they've been implemented. Um, and they also provide the technical uh, references for people that are interested. So really important resources um, that can be made use of by um, governments of both participants in the treaty and non-participants. So this is not a, a closed process at all. Um, and that's sort of the beauty of it. So how does this work? Um, I thought it'd be a good example. So um, in practice, um, academics and researchers um, go out and work with fisheries where they know there's an issue and a problem and they bring their innovative solutions back to the table to these working groups, in this case, uh, the Seabird Bycatch Working Group. Um, we know there's this area of fisheries uh, behind the fishing vessel that's sort of the danger zone. So birds can either get, for example, caught as the um, target fish is being recovered on the haul or on the set as it's going out. Um, and here's the danger zone behind the vessel in the schematic um, that I pulled from BirdLife. And you can see that um, it's really in this one concentrated area. And so um, there's been some interesting developments in terms of uh, mitigation for uh, bird interactions in this zone. Uh, most recently, things like hook pods. Um, but the most tried and true are things like uh, that are really basic are um, these Tory lines or streamer lines, and this is a schematic um, showing this bird streaming line that goes back beyond the back of the vessel as the hooks and lines are being deployed. Um, and if you look at the American Bird Conservancy YouTube channel and search for bycatch, we have a suite of videos that we produced in English and Spanish to describe the nature of interactions with different types of fisheries and some of the mitigation um, that is effective in those fisheries. So solutions exist, um, but we're in a constant state of um, finding new innovative solutions um, that are uh, technically practical um, and also very cost effective. So those are some of the criteria that the bycatch working group looks at um, when they want to advise on a best practice, because you may design the, you know, most efficient, effective mitigation measure, but if it costs $300 a piece, it's not going to be practical for those fishers. So here's an example of bird scaring lines or Tory lines, as they're known, um, to keep seabirds out of this danger zone. And this is one of the ACAP best practice. Um, efforts, um, and it not only protects lines um, like long lines that are going out, um, but it can also be effective um, in trawl fisheries where there's a third wire or net phone cable that's um, tracking the net and going down. Um, so this is a real efficient way. Um, and a, as a result of using this mitigation, a recent analysis, um, sorry, uh, we'll go on to the next slide, has shown that um, in the U.S. fleets where these mitigation efforts have been put into use, um, we've seen a dramatic decrease in the numbers of albatross killed in these fisheries. Um, so this data um, 
is from the Western Pacific Region and Fishery Management Council, um, but there's a more recent paper by Ed Melvin um, looking across four different fisheries in Alaska demonstrating the same thing where um, bird catches go down dramatically um, when simple mitigation such as Tory line or bit bird streamer lines are put into use. And this is the kind of information that's really important in demonstrating those best practices, that it, it can be effective um, in reducing the number of albatross. And then also another criteria is that it doesn't decrease the target catch for the fishers because, again, that's going to be a no starter if you're decreasing the non target. So many of these uh, seabird measures were implemented um, in response to the heavy bycatch of our North Pacific species. And so in the U.S. waters, many of the mitigation um, is already being, that's advised by ACAP is already being implemented um, in our fisheries. Um, and here's the annotation here. Um, in Alaskan fishery, they reduce uh, albatross bycatch, both Laysan and Blackfoot, um, 77 to 90% in the four fisheries that they looked at after the implementation of mitigation. So we know that it works and that tens of thousands of albatross can be saved by implementing this, these mitigation measures. Um, so we know it works um, and BirdLife has demonstrated this in other places like South Africa. Um, and as I mentioned, they're constantly looking at new innovative tools such as hook pods. Um, but simple methods such as bird scaring lines and the timing of setting um, has also um, worked to reduce bycatch. We also know that removing threats on islands works to increase the number of birds um, and provide resiliency to um, these populations. But I didn't have time to go into great detail about um, efforts on seabird breeding islands, but uh, the Jones paper and Brooks paper cover um, some of the dramatic benefits that we see from the removal of non-native. Um, and then finally, you know, international coordination is essential for this conservation across the range of the pelagic species. And unfortunately, um, spending a lot of time in rooms talking about these species and their concerns is a big part of our jobs as um, conservationists and managers to plan for the future and also to try to figure out um, what which actions will be um, the best use of our funds um, and how we can um, leverage change across the range of the species. Um, so what do we hope to gain through the U.S.'s accession to ACAP and the in the passing of the Albatross and Petrol Conservation Act. Um, we hope that we can increase attention on the issues affecting seabirds. And now that I've given you sort of a seabird 101, um, hopefully you have more information or know where to look um, for information about the threats that are impacting these birds um, and the solutions that are out there. Um, we hope by the U.S participating in this international treaty will have other Pacific Rim countries participate. Um, our neighbors to the north and south, uh, Canada and Mexico, as I said, do um, participate in the ACAP meetings, although they're like the U.S. non-voting members. Um, and so we may help to leverage their participation. Um, and also we can provide um, best practice and tools to make fisheries more bird friendly, not just in the U.S. where many of these uh, mitigation measures are already in place, but to kind of level the playing field across fisheries um, globally um, and bring them up to the standards that we already see. Um, what the Act won't do, and I, I think this is important to cover as well, um, it won't really change how we manage fisheries. Um, as I said, there's no enforcement um, changes to the level of enforcement, and it won't put additional restrictions on fisheries. It'll just provide tools and expertise um, so that fishers can become uh, 
more bird friendly. Um, and as you know, um, the seafood market is coming under increasingly um, intense pressure for extraction. Um, and so there's a lot of effort to make seafood industries more um, sustainable. And there's a blue label, the Marine Stewardship Council uh, eco label on many seafood products today. Um, and so by providing these tools and expertise, uh, fishers can use some of these best practice and gain um, leverage in the market, you know, independently without um, needing to have um, any kind of enforcement action. So it's a market-driven um, effort to increase their, their mitigation and reduce their impacts. Um, and finally, I'm going to end with one of my favorite birds here, the waved albatross or the Galapagos albatross. Um, by engaging in the Albatross and Petrol Conservation Act, we'll not only um, demonstrate leadership domestically, but we can share and help coordinate action for globally imperiled species like the waved albatross, um, which occurs really only on two islands in Ecuador um, and has very little um, governmental um, support for their action. So we can try to elevate um, the awareness of this issue um, and the importance of some of these species that um, within domestic the their domestic arena are not given um, some of the level of effort and conservation actions that are really needed to affect change. <laughs>